Now, you might have heard the term Donald Duck Tanks before, and no, it's not some forgotten Disney lore that I missed out on. It's in reference to the duplex drive or DD tanks of the Second World War by the Allies. These are also sometimes referred to as swimming tanks. Now, the main premise of these tanks were to be deployed alongside infantry in order to support them as they attempted to establish a hold on either a beach or a riverfront. Now, to get to the iconic images of a floating canvas block in the water, we must explore the history of amphibious tanks. Not long after the world saw the first tanks roll across no man's land in an effort to break the stalemate that was the First World War, we saw the Mark IX. This tank was primarily designed to be a troop and supply transporter with just two machine guns for armaments. On November 11th, 1918, the first amphibious version would be seen in the Hendon Reservoir. It had a number of steel drums attached to it to give it the ability to float, and well, that is about all the world will see of this first amphibious tank. After the initial dive into amphibious vehicles, the interwar period saw two types being developed. One type was that of lightly armored tanks, like the Soviet T-37A tank, which was the first mass-produced amphibious tank in the world. However, it was quite small with extremely thin armor, and was able to stay afloat without any external support, albeit it was quite slow at about 3 miles per hour on the water. The other type was that like the Japanese Type 2 KME. This one had a removable pontoon that allowed the tank to float and propel itself to shore without needing adequate shore facilities to deliver tanks. The tank would detach itself from its floating sections of what's on shore and continue on to its objective. Now, onto the focus point of today's video, the British take on the situation. Nicholas Strausser created his first amphibious starts of work by developing a pontoon that could be mounted to a light tank along with an outboard motor to provide propulsion. The British War Office then concluded that this design was sufficient in allowing a tank to become amphibious in nature. However, it was far too bulky and impractical to deploy from any sort of transport at the time. So Nicholas went back to the drawing board and created the flotation screen. This was essentially a floating canvas screen that would be supported by horizontal metal hoops for rigidness and vertical rubber tubes filled with air to provide positive buoyancy. The screen covered the top half of the tank, leaving the track submerged. After landing, it could be collapsed so that it would not interfere with the tank's effectiveness. The term duplex drive came from tanks being adopted to provide two forms of power through its tracks and propellers through the same engine without the need of an additional outboard motor like previous designs. In a dashing coincidence, the first trials used a light tank Mark 7 that was modified with the screen and used power from the tank's engine for the propeller. These trials took place in the same location as Britain's first amphibious tank the Mark 9 did in 1918. The trials were a success, and initial orders were created to create DD tanks at the Valentine. However, these never saw actual combat deployment, and served as training platforms for the soon-to-be famous DD M4 Sherman. Why was this the case? Well, it was due to a few factors, as the Sherman was far more effective to the Valentine in several ways, as well it could launch with its gun facing forward, at the ready so as soon as the crew dropped its canvas screen they can get right to work. Initial production was done solely by the British, but eventually the Americans would create their own conversions. The flotation screen would be attached to a welded-on steel platform, and the top speed of these tanks can move in the water was approximately 4.6 miles per hour. Both the driver and commander could steer in the water by either hydraulic control by the driver or by a tiller that the commander used. And it's worth noting that the commander could see over the screen itself. The British would use the M4A2 and A4 versions and the Americans used the M4A1. A system of compressed air bottles inflated the 36 vertical rubber tubes to give it its final form. It took around 15 minutes to inflate. Crews were also equipped with emergency life rafts as well as Davis submerged escape apparatuses that were capable of providing 5 minutes of air in the event of emergency. These tanks would be carried and launched by tank landing crafts, 4 would be carried by an American LCT, and 5 could be carried by the British counterpart as it was slightly longer. After D-Day, a second version of the flotation screen would come out with improvements to the screen, a new type of bilge, and secondary hydraulic controls for the commander, as well as an air compressor to replace the old air cylinder system that pressurized the screen. By far, the most prevalent usage of D-Day tanks was during the invasion of Normandy, where they were intended to help the Allies establish a foothold in France. However, the success they had depended on which beach they would be landed at, for at this point, the weather had already delayed the invasion by a number of days, and it still left the seas very unfavorable. So many tanks were delivered directly ashore by landing crafts, or the ones that did launch at sea were subject to being swamped, hit by artillery, or run over by larger vessels while heading to shore. Those that did make it ashore did find success in supporting the infantry assaults and establishing the Allied foothold in France. Omaha Beach was the worst by far, as nearly every single tank that was initially launched was lost. Out of the initial 29, 27 were lost, with only 2 making it to shore. DD tanks also saw usage in Operation Dragoon and various river crossings like the Rhine and the Po rivers. Post World War II, we saw tanks shift into larger, more armored vehicles with far heavier engines and guns. As a result, main battle tanks lost the ability to be floated easily enough to warrant use. So we saw development of dedicated amphibious infantry fighting vehicles or tanks. And that's going to wrap up another video. I just want to say, wow, um, as of 30-something minutes ago, we had 100 subscribers. It really means a lot. 
So I went ahead and created a channel discord if you want to come hang out and just chat. It'll be in the description of this video as well as in my channel page. And once again, I really do appreciate it. 100 subscribers is a lot of people. I didn't expect it so soon. It's been less than two months. I just really appreciate the positive support I've been receiving. As a result, I have a lot planned in the coming months for this channel. I plan to expand my horizons as some would say. But with that said, I hope you have a good one and I'll catch you on the next one.